one thing that I wanted to mention is that something that I have written in my journal, um, and I'm just going to paraphrase, but Ellen White says that of all the stories of the Bible, none are more significant than our stories because the Bible happened, you know, the, those stories, they are, they're historical. They took place long ago, and it's so incredible to see how God is working today in our lives. And so I'm just so thankful that Danielle is going to be here and is sharing her testimony this morning. For our scripture reading this morning, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I pray the Lord add his blessing to this and to the young lady who's going to give us our prayer and message this morning. Good morning, everyone. I would just like to invite you all as far as possible to kneel with me in prayer this morning. Our God in heaven... I just want to thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you, Father, for bringing each one of these people here and blessing us with your presence, Lord. We want to ask you, in accordance to Luke 11, 13, to pour out your Holy Spirit in this place, Father, that you will just be here among us and bless us, Lord, through your Spirit's presence. I cannot do anything of myself, Lord, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Father, I just pray that you will anoint my lips. Lord, hide me behind your cross that only you will be seen. Father God, help me to speak in accordance to your will as you see fit that you will be glorified. Not myself or my past or anything, but just you, Lord. And we thank you for for loving us, Father, for sending Jesus to redeem us from the darkness. In his precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right. Thank you guys for having me. I really count it a blessing and a privilege to be here and share my story. I'm going to start at the very beginning. I was born in Green River, Wyoming, and it was kind of a, a, turmoil, a time of turmoil in my parents' life. They were really struggling in their marriage. Um, but nonetheless, I was very blessed When I ask my mom about my past, she always says that um, I was a very, very happy baby, always smiling, always laughing, and um, my joy was found mostly in music. And I would sing everywhere that I went and dance everywhere that I went, and it was just very natural for me. I also loved nature. I loved to spend time outdoors, and often as a family, we would go out on camping trips and things together, and those are... um, Most of my memories from my childhood are are out in nature on our camping trips together. My mom went to a Baptist church, and she met a woman there who was also pregnant at the same time that she was pregnant with me. And Shanda was born just 12 days before I was. And um, let's see. I'm the one with the cool shoes. (laughs) And... (laughs) Shanda and I were pretty much inseparable for the first 10 years of our lives. I would go over to their house and and spend weeks at a time there. And so I would often attend church with their family. And I think that that was actually a blessing from the Lord because um, my father's alcoholism was, was growing to be a great problem in our home. And I think he provided that as a safe haven for me to kind of get away from that because I don't have any memories from those times. And so I'm, I'm happy for that. Shanda and I were both baptized together in the Baptist church when we were nine years old, and this photo was taken around that same time. And so I remember that time um, not really being a heart-changing time for me. They asked us, you know, we'd been going to uh, Sunday school there for a long time. They asked us if we loved Jesus and wanted him to be our Savior, and we did. Um, But it wasn't really a giving up of anything of my own. It wasn't really um, dedicating my life to him. It was just, I love Jesus, and that's what you do when you love Jesus. So um, a couple years later, we moved to Washington State, and it didn't take very long for me to turn from my walk with Jesus because I didn't really have a relationship with him. I never read the Bible. I didn't have... um, 
a prayer life. It was just very superficial, and so it, it melted away very quickly. But when we moved to Washington State, we moved in next door to an Adventist family. And the gentleman here who was graduating from high school at the time um, started dating my sister, and they started having Bible studies at our house on Friday evenings. And my sister told me this a few weeks ago. I don't actually remember this part of my story. (laughs) But when they were having these Bible studies, I was really enjoying them, and sometimes I would just cry, and I would say, people need to know this. Why don't people know this? And I started sending literature to my mother, who's a Christian but still in the Baptist church. I started sending her literature on the Sabbath and, and um, talking to my friends about it, and I was getting really excited. Um, this was around that time. I was a freshman in high school, um, but I remember the day that something changed. I had this CD, and I was listening to it over and over and over again. And I was sitting on the couch one day, and I just started thinking, you know, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to be what what everyone tells me I need to be. I can make my own decisions. I can go crazy if I want and be whatever I want, and, and it really doesn't matter. And I actually looked up the lyric to one of those songs that I was listening to, and, and it says... We make this new religion to escape what we've become. Your signal's fading, so let go to face this recreation. I didn't realize that the music that I was listening to was impacting my heart. When we behold, we become changed, right? And I was inviting these thoughts into my mind that weren't safe. And it didn't take very long before I started changing. I accepted that lie, that lie that Satan tells, and I started making it my own. And I started changing from the inside out. And when I was at home, I, would, I started to feel a lot of sorrow and discontent. And um, I started um, putting on a lot of makeup and making myself look dead because that was how I felt inside. And it just got worse and worse, and I started using these um, makeup and dress to express um, that unrest that I was feeling inside. This is a, a picture taken around the time when my sister and her husband got married. She had been baptized into the church, and, and they got married, and Shanda came out for their wedding. This was the girl who I got baptized with um, just a few years before. And one summer, I decided that I was just going to let everything go, and I was going to live for the music. And I, um, I ran off halfway across the state to chase a band that I was following, and um, so I quit, willingly quit my job because I didn't show up. I just quit going. And I shaved half of my head. I shaved my head into a mohawk, and I just decided that I was going to live for the music because that was all that really made sense to me anymore. And I started um, really just trying to express myself um, and the way that I felt, because the music that I was following was very dark, and it was uh, full of blasphemy, and I um, just kind of started getting taken over. And the expressions grew and grew, until I started wearing horns everywhere that I went. And, and the, the makeup came back as far as trying to show that I just felt like I was dead inside. And it just got worse and worse. And this was kind of at the peak of that place where I was just gone to everything other than that music that I was listening to. And this is, these are when I'm on my way to, to go to shows to hear this music played. And I started drawing on my face and my arms with Sharpie pins. And you can kind of see in this picture, I had written a song lyric up my arm. And it said, remorse is useless. The song lyric that that came from says, remorse is useless now. God doesn't want us back now, baby. And that was the lie that I believed. I believed that I had walked so far out into my rebellion that God didn't want me back. 
And I realized that there was this spiritual turmoil that was going on inside, and I had to make a choice. I was lost in addictions, eating disorders, depression, anxiety attacks. And I realized, I woke up one day, and I just had this voice in my mind that said, you need to change or you're going to die. And I knew that I faced a choice. I had to choose life or death. And that was when I turned back to life. I decided that I didn't want to live life the way that I was living anymore. And I wanted to get back to that peace that I had had as a child, out in nature. I could see the object lessons in nature. And there's a scripture in Romans, I think it is, where it says that uh, professing themselves to be wise, they uh, became fools and they worshiped the creation instead of the creator creator. And that's kind of where I was. I was looking to nature and kind of making them gods, and a lot of the world's religions do that. Christ Object Lesson, page 116, says, this is talking about the pearl of great price. The merchant man in the parable represents a class who were sincerely desiring truth. In different nations, there were earnest and thoughtful men who sought in literature and science and the religions of the heathen world for that which they could receive as the soul's treasure. They had been longing and praying for light from heaven, and when Christ had re- was revealed to them, they received him with gladness. And this was the beginning of that journey for me. I was really looking for truth, but instead of turning back to the Bible and back to Jesus, I turned to literature and science and the religions of the world. And in this time where I was turning back to spirituality, another really amazing thing happened. And my nephew was born. He's the love of my life. And I, um, that really changed my heart in a big way because, you know, that love that you have of seeing a new life come into the world, it really changes your heart. So I decided I was going to live different completely, and I started eating a vegan diet. It was mostly for animal rights reasons that I decided I was going to do that, but I started eating differently, and I started getting back into nature more. This is me with my nephew. We're hugging trees. And I still had that, you know, creative self-expression that I was still doing, but it was, it was shifting away from the darkness and more towards nature. And around that time, I met someone who was very special and who would play a big significant part in um, my surrendering my life back to Jesus. This is Michelle Lesher. I'm sure that a lot of you have met her. She was the dietitian out of the Black Hills Health and Education Center for a time. And this is her husband, Larry, with my nephew, Josiah. And I met this couple when we were living out in Washington State, and that was right before they moved out here. So at that point, I spent the next few months working with my boyfriend as a performance clown. He had been juggling since second grade, and before meeting him, I had decided that I wanted to be a clown. I love to perform, I love to make people laugh, and I had made the decision that I wanted to learn how to juggle and how to be a clown, and then I met him. And so I really felt like it was a leading from the divine to... um, pursue that. We talked a lot about spending time as we got our career going, just going to orphanages and volunteering there. We wanted to reach out to the hurting children. And so sometimes we would do kids parties. Sometimes we would um, perform at shows where there was other people doing different performances. And it was a lot of fun. But he had an old injury that resurfaced and we had to cancel all of our gigs. We had about 15 gigs lined up in Seattle and we had to cancel all of those. And so that kind of came to an abrupt end. Not long after that, I was invited by my sister to make a really big life change. She was going to come out to the Black Hills Health and Education Center with her husband who was going through the internship at the farm. And I had been working at a Thai food restaurant. I had developed a really active prayer life. And even though I loved my job and I loved the customers, I didn't feel any peace in my heart about being there because I was vegan 
and I didn't want to support the industry of selling meat and eggs all day. And so I was really praying to the divine, was what I called it at that time, that I could find a job that I would have peace in doing. And my sister invited me to come out with them to the Black Hills Health and Education Center. And that was a really challenging decision for me to make. And I went back and forth a few times between deciding to go and then changing my mind. But I just kept having this thought re-enter my mind, and it was just getting stronger and stronger. If you don't go to South Dakota, you're going to spend the rest of your life wondering, what would have happened if I would have went to South Dakota that summer? And I just thought that until the impression was so strong that I just forced myself to sit down and say, what's the big deal about South Dakota? And after writing out a list of all of the pros and cons of going and staying, I finally realized that all of the things that were convincing me to stay were just based on fear. And that was another thing that I'd been praying a lot about. I was really controlled to a large degree by fears for, of different things for different reasons. And, you know, I didn't want to be controlled by my fears anymore. I didn't want to be held back by them. And so when I realized that all of the reasons to go were beautiful and all of the reasons to stay were just fear, I decided to go for it. I just love this verse in Philippians 1.6 where it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The more and more I gave him freedom to move in my life, the more and more he did move in my life. And he brought me to a place that I never expected would change my whole life. So we headed out eastward towards South Dakota to meet up with Larry and Michelle Lesher, the couple that I had mentioned meeting in Washington a couple years before. And the day after we got here, it snowed, and it was in May, and I thought, oh man, what have I got myself into? But I spent a lot of time in the greenhouse for the first few months, and I was seeding flats, lots and lots of seeds. But it was an amazing thing to hold that little seed in my hand and, pl and stick it in the ground. And watch something amazing happen. There's just undeniable truths that when you see over and over again, you can't keep pushing them aside. When I saw the Lord working through making these tiny little seeds sprout, my heart was touched. And we would, um, we would spend a lot of time together, and we would often talk about spiritual things. And as the little plants grew and they began to fruit, we would go out and we would harvest them. And I had the opportunity to go out to the farmer's market and get to, to present this produce to these people. And they were always so happy. They would just smile and they'd be like, thank you. And they really appreciated the food that we were presenting to them. And that really spoke to me, to take it from a seed all the way up to handing the produce to the smiling customer. It was, it was really a special experience. And... The Lord was speaking to me through those, those hours out on the farm, just being in the soil and, and pondering the spiritual applications of what I was experiencing. And, you know, God works in pretty amazing ways when I look back because he sent someone here who I could connect with and relate to. This is my friend Chris, and he was also here as an intern. He was Hindu, and he was here from India. And... We actually spent quite a bit of time together doing yoga and drinking tea and talking about spiritual things. And I look back on those conversations and I really see how the Lord was growing me in those, in those conversations, softening my heart in ways that I needed to be softened before I could move forward into what he was about to reveal to me. One day I was out on the farm and my brother-in-law brought me an iPad and he said, or an iPod and he said, you should listen to this message. And I thought, okay, it was about music, and so, of course, I'll, I'll listen to it. And uh, the message was by Ivor Myers. I don't know if, if any of you guys have heard any of his stuff on music, but it, um, it really reveals how a lot of the music has 
syncopated beats, and it kind of dates back to um, the spiritual roots, and it's kind of hypnotic. And I listened to that message, and I was really impressed and convicted, but I didn't really make any changes at that point. I just had to chew on it for a while. But that was actually a big part of my conversion experience, was hearing that message. I was offered the opportunity to participate in the Wellness Coach Certification class in exchange for filming it, so I did that, and I was very excited about it because I really had a desire to learn more about natural healing and natural remedies. And it was a great experience for me because I really bonded with my classmates. And I remember on the last day of class, a large number of us hiked out to a nice swimming hole. We spent some time together, and then when we all came back to campus, we were all preparing to go our separate ways, and we all just took some time to come together in a big circle out in the parking lot. And holding hands together, they all sang spiritual songs, and we all prayed together. And up to that point, I hadn't really prayed very much with other people. My prayers were very abstract, so I didn't really feel comfortable praying with others. So it was a very memorable and really awesome experience for me because I had never shared that kind of spiritual joy with other people. I also was growing close to a lady who worked up, works out at the center. Her name's Jackie. And she just kind of took me under her wing, and she related to me where I was at and um, shared with me some of the testimony that that she has because she's come through a lot too and I also started making friends with a lady named Rosa now Chris the intern that I was talking about earlier he had talked to Rosa about getting a little bit of massage hands-on with her because he wanted to take that knowledge back to his village in India and help some of the elders there and he knew that I would be interested in learning about that also and so he asked her if I could come along. So Jackie was actually our body that day, and, and she showed us a diagram. These are the muscles of the back. This is what they're called. And she showed us the strokes. And then it was Chris's turn, and then it was my turn. And as soon as I put my hands on her back and started with the first stroke, they were both like in unison, like, whoa. And I'm like, what? And they're like, you're a natural. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. I wasn't really expecting any, any kind of response. And by the end of that first session together, they were both like, you're a natural. You need to be a therapist, and we're going to be praying that you can go through this school. And I had decided that I wanted to go to school because I had dropped out of high school. I didn't even have a GED, and I wanted to get a good job. So I had decided that I wanted to go to school, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to pursue. And so I started praying about that. And I talked to the business manager there, and she said, well, if you can get half, then we'll meet in the middle. And I had nowhere near that. And so I just kind of forgot about it. And a couple weeks later, I was just really thinking about a burden with the thought, man, if I wish I could go to this school. And it reminded me about when I made the decision to go out to South Dakota in the first place. The week before they bought the books, Janet came up to me and she said, if you can just get money for books, then we'll work the rest out. And I said, how much is that? And she said, $500. And that was exactly how much I had. So I felt like that was the Lord really opening the door. So I walked through it. And I started massage school. But I also met a really special couple, and I think that you guys have probably met um, this couple, a lot of you. And um, Dan Gabbert and his wife Patsy, they're, they're very peaceful people. And when I started interacting with Dan, and I had um, learned a little bit from him in the wellness coach certification class, I just thought, wow, this, this man has such a peaceful presence about him. And I think of that message that Clarence often shares where the wife came out and she says, I don't know what he has, but I want it too. And that was exactly how I felt about Dan. And I just thought, you know, this man is really special. And so I decided that I was going to start going to church services when he would speak. And the first day that I went, I just kind of went and sat in the back row, hoping that no one would notice me. And the place where I was at, relating to Christianity at the time, you know, I was looking at the religions of the world. So I wanted something that was all light and peace and happiness and, and you know, I didn't resonate with Christianity because I didn't want to think about death and the cross when I thought about God. 
And so the first thing that he said that afternoon is, today we're going to talk about the crucifixion. And I thought, oh, man, the crucifixion, why that, anything but that? And the next thing he said was, you're probably thinking, oh, the crucifixion, why that, anything but that? And so I sat up a little bit straighter, and I thought, okay, God, you have something here for me today. I'm going to pay attention. And he, he shared the cross that day in a way that I had never heard before. And he talked about sin and how it separates us from God. And I knew that there were decisions that I made in my life that separated me from the light. And so, okay, I understand that. And he started talking about how, you know, when we, when we choose those things that separate us, that's sin. And, and when you walk away from life, the natural occurrence is death. And so, if, you know, we have to die as a result of choosing those sins. But if we choose Jesus, he already took those sins for us and bore them on the cross, and he is our substitute for that death. And I started to understand it. I started to see Jesus. I started to see the cross and understand it and appreciate it. And something in my heart started to melt. And I was just, for weeks after that, I was just thinking about it and praying about it. And my life really started to change at that point. Christ's Object Lessons, page 118, says, The light of heaven penetrated the darkened mind of those who had been deceived by the enemies of Christ. They now saw him exalted to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, Acts 5.31. I also started spending a lot of time with um, Oliver, and he was also um, volunteering out on the farm. And he taught me a lot about the Bible. He taught me a lot about Jesus, and we would memorize scripture songs together. And I met his parents, who dedicate their lives to ministry to God. And coming to know these people really changed a lot of my view of Christianity also, because all along I had wanted to Um, help people. I wanted to serve people. And I thought, you know, I want to be a missionary. Even though I wasn't a Christian, I knew that that was a really easy way to go out and help people. And so when I met these people and I heard about their experiences serving Christ in the mission field, I started thinking, well, maybe Christianity isn't so far from what I believe. This is little Hadassah, and this is right around the time that they were deciding to, um, well, their time up on, their time on the farm was up, and they were traveling back home. And like I said, I had decided that I was going to be in the school of massage, and I had been in classes for about a month. And so they took off, and um, I moved into a little dorm room, and I had the privilege of having a room that was the window was right against the ground, and the deer would lay right outside my bedroom window. And so I, I got to have more intimate experiences with the wildlife out there and just observing them and learning those object lessons um, was really helping me to turn more towards God. So my journey began, and we started... Um, spending time together before our classes, reading from the book Reflecting Christ. Our teacher would read a page from that devotional every morning, and that really helped me to understand Christ more and more. And we were given the Ministry of Healing book for our oral communications class, and that also helped me to understand my relationship with Christ and our relationship with helping other people and how we get closer to God by doing that. I would also spend a lot of time in between classes and after classes sitting right out on the creek on a rock in the middle of the water and um, just soaking in the nature and soaking in the lessons from the Lord. And the 10 months of school flew by really fast. We had... Tom Meyer of Little Light Studios come out to the center to um, f- do some filming with Larry. He was, he's working on a documentary called Pulse. And, Larry, and 
um, Tom came out to do some filming for that. And before he left, he gifted me his series called the Battlefield Hollywood series. And he used to film out in Hollywood. And he saw a lot of the great controversy and the conflict that goes on behind the scenes. And so him and his brother and a childhood friend came together and they've made documentaries revealing the great controversy through um, that scene in Hollywood. And he gifted me that set and it took me a while before I decided that I was going to listen to them. But the first one I watched is called Magic Kingdom. And I grew up watching Disney videos, a lot of us do, and we think that they're harmless. But when you see behind the scenes and you start looking at it from a different light and you start reading into the spiritual applications there and listening to the lyrics of the songs, you kind of start seeing that they're not always harmless. And the theme of that was revealing that a lot of the Disney movies teach small children to listen to your heart. Follow your heart. But the Lord tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked and we can't know them. And they also kind of portray the woman's body in in a not very virtuous way. And I started realizing that I was relating to my body and my heart in a way that wasn't in harmony with what God wanted me to look at my life as. And um, by the end of that documentary, I was just sitting there sobbing. And I realized that I can't trust my heart. I realized that I'm programmed and that I cannot figure out what everything means on my own because what I believe isn't quite right. And I watched the other four documentaries, and it was the same every time. I was just sobbing by the end of each one, and my conviction was deeper and and stronger. And in the quiet of those evenings, what was actually happening was that my eyes were being opened. I had always believed in God, even though I had wandered away from him. But I didn't believe in Satan. I didn't believe that the great controversy was real. And when I watched these documentaries, I realized that the great controversy is real, that Satan is real, and that we are each involved in a battle for our souls. And that was when... I decided that I was going to turn my life back over to Jesus. So I ordered a little pamphlet on baptism from Amazing Facts, but I didn't tell anyone about it. I would sit in my room, and I would read through it, and I'd look up the scriptures, and um, I was just kind of keeping it to myself because I didn't want anyone else's opinions to make my decision for me. I wanted to let the Lord show me that this was what he wanted me to do. And I went to church one morning, and and I sang special music, and I sang, I Surrender All. And one of my friends from the center, her name's Patricia, she's in the middle there, she came up to me afterwards, and she said, something seems different. She said, are you talking with Jesus? And I said, I think I'm falling in love. And she asked me if I wanted to do Bible studies with her, and so I started studying with her. And right around that time... Um, I was reaching the end of massage school, and we traveled out to Wyoming, and I actually took my massage board eight days before I graduated because they were really excited for me to start working at the center, and I did that. And we sang, my sister and my mother and I sang um, Trust and Obey at the graduation because I had given my life back to Christ, and I wanted to live my life in this new servant um, role that he had given me, following him by trusting and obeying him. This is my graduation picture, and it's me right out on that rock I used to sit on all the time um, during school. And this was especially a joyful time for me, not just because of the great accomplishment that I had just come through, but also because... Jesus had now given me a plan and a purpose for my life. Before, I was just kind of wandering around, and I didn't really have a path to look down, and now I had something to put my hands to, and that was extra special to me. 
I then went out and traveled to Washington State to go to a conference. It's called Army. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, but it's um, it's a play on words. Um, Arm me with the word of God, and it also stands for Adventist Revival Movement for the End Times. And while I was there, I heard a message called The Truth That Transforms the World. And Tim Riesenberger was the brother that shared that. And he's an ER doctor, and he has a, a really unique view of God's love for man. Because he gets to see these people come in in these critical conditions... And he always sees the same thing. When the parents bring their children in and their children are dying, the children always say, why? Why not me? Why couldn't I take that place and take that death for them? You know, why wasn't it me driving? Why wasn't it me who got sick? And they would give anything, and they stay right next to that child's side until there's no more hope left. And... When I realized that that's how God loves me, I decided that I wasn't going to really keep it to myself anymore, that I decided that I wanted to be rebaptized. And I responded to his altar call and went up and took a stand for Jesus. And this is me with Tim after responding to that altar call. I also had the privilege, the Lord took me out to ASI, and I got to meet the other two brothers from Little Light Studios. And so I just wanted to take an opportunity to just kind of thank them for, you know, the biggest part of bringing down the wall for me. This is Chad and Fadia. You've probably met them. You may have met them. They're Anchor Point Films, and they were living out at the center for a while. And I actually spent um, some time with them in Bible study as well, and they ministered to me a lot while they were here. And I also spent a lot of time online um, listening to Doug Batchelor sermons, and that kind of helped me prepare in the large part for my baptism and answered a lot of questions that I had. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 So I decided that I was going to be baptized on September 1st. And that was when we had our spiritual retreat out at the, at the wellness center. And the really neat thing is that the Lord worked it out that Tim Riesenberger was actually our speaker for our camp meeting. So that very same message that I heard that moved my heart to take a stand for Jesus was the last message that I heard before I went down into the water and surrendered my life to him. So that was really a special treat. It was a very humbling experience for me. I sucked in a bunch of water and choked really hard, but I guess the Lord thought I needed that, so I appreciated it. Now the Lord in his grace is preparing me um, fulfilling those dreams of mine to work in in, um, being a ministry, a missionary. And he's sending me to Cuba. I'm leaving in just about two weeks, actually. So I'm planning my first mission trip now, and that's very exciting for me. And the other thing that I'm preparing for is to reach out and and help those who are journeying things that I've come through, addictions, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. The biggest thing that turned me to the desire of wanting to reach out to these people was this woman here. Her name's Linda. She committed suicide just this past year in September. And a couple months before I found out, it happened three months before I found out, actually. And... I had really had a strong conviction on my heart to call her. And I just thought, you know, I don't think that she's doing good. I think that she needs some help. But I was afraid because we had always connected on spiritual things in the past, and we didn't share that anymore, and I was afraid to reach out to her. And um, a few months later, I found out that she had committed suicide right around the time that the Lord was impressing me to reach out to her. And so... I am really convicted that that's what I need to do. And in May, I'm going to be going to a conference um, called Mind Cure, and that's going to teach me how to reach out to those people um, even more, not just through my testimony, but also knowing how to connect with those people on um, on a greater level because kind of understanding how the mind part of it works. And 
Um, I just wanted to share this one last quote. It's from Adventist Home, page 59. A little time spent in sowing your wild oats, dear young friends, will produce a crop that will embitter your whole life. An hour of thoughtlessness, once yielding, yielding to temptation, may turn the whole current of your life in the wrong di- direction. You can have but one youth. Make that useful. When once you have passed over the ground, you can never return to rectify your mistakes. He who refuses to connect with God and puts himself in the way of temptation will surely fall. God is testing every youth. Many have excused their carelessness and irreverence because of the wrong example given to them by more experienced professors. But this should not detour any from right doing. In the day of final accounts, you will plead no such excuses as you plead now. So it's true. Jesus saves. And I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for listening to my testimony. And um, just keep me in your prayers as I'm moving forward for the Lord and his glory. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the testimony that you have given to each one of us. The testimony of your love and your patience, of your long-suffering, and that you're never willing to give up on us. Lord Jesus, I pray that my testimony will just give hope to those who are maybe struggling with doubt or fear. Maybe they're looking upon a family member who's walking out in the wrong direction. Or maybe, Lord, they just aren't sure anymore if you're real. Father God, I just pray that you will take these hearts into your hands today and that they will be uplifted with hope that you are moving, and you will never stop moving, Lord, until you come again. Keep us each in your fold until that day, Lord. We cannot wait to see you in the clouds, Father. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.